if you are a natural gas property owner and have enough acres that you've really been thinking about putting those inside of an LLC or a family limited partnership or some sort of an entity, uh, or maybe you already did that years ago and you're questioning whether or not that's still the effective best use of your, your acreage, then I think you might find a lot of value in this discussion I had today with Paul Rushton, an attorney who's the chair of the business and finance department down at Rosen Jenkins and Greenwald down out of Wilkesbury. Paul came up to our studio today, had an awesome talk with me, kind of long, which isn't surprising when you get a financial guy and a lawyer together. But um, we talked about a lot of different uh, pros and cons of the different entities and what you might want to be looking for now and, and into the future for you and your family. So if you're interested in learning more of those uh, nuts and bolts of what makes those tick and, and what are the advantages, click on through and keep watching. And I think you'll get a lot of uh, sort of good nuggets of information. And also a special shout out to Paul and his firm for uh, matching our donation. I told him I would donate $1,000 from Stonehouse to whatever charity he chose. And Paul chose the uh, United Way of Susquehanna County um, because there's a nice matching uh, grant opportunity coming out of the Community Foundation. So uh, we may actually get our $1,000 donated uh, through Paul and then his firm is donating a matching uh, that amount. So that's $2,000. And it looks like there's potential for the community foundation to match that. So he turned a $1,000 into a $4,000 donation. So great thinking. I'm excited about this interview. I hope you get a lot out of it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. We're doing, Paul's going to be our guest speaker at two seminars that we're having coming in May 24th in Wyalusing and June 14th in uh, Montrose. So if you have a chance to, to join us up there, you can meet us both face to face and some of our other team members and be happy to talk to you either during that meeting in the Q&A session or during, uh, you know, off on the side. But we'll be going through a lot of stuff with regards to uh, landowners that are looking at putting those acres or have those acres inside of some sort of an entity. So hope you get a lot out of this and hope you enjoy it. All right, so with me is Paul Rushton, attorney Paul Rushton. I'm sorry, I know you long enough that I feel like I just call you Paul. You can call me Paul, that's fine. <laughs> all but, right, all uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, I, you know you're very aware of this. We've been working with uh, natural gas clients for a long time. You have as well, uh, since it's really blossomed into, uh, into this area, Northeast PA. And I know that you've been working with a lot of folks on typically the larger landowners that are, that are uh, looking at setting up entities or they have entities, entities being uh, family limited partnerships and family limited liability companies and things like that and trusts. There's a lot of options. I know we can't go through all of this today. We don't want to bore everybody that badly, yes, but yes. <laughs> we're not even five minutes in and we're already worried about it. <laughs> right, right. You get a financial guy and a legal guy yeah, talking. Exactly. Oh, no. Uh, but I can say We've been talking and you know that we've been doing a lot of, uh, recently been doing a sort of a road show into in the Bradford, Susquehanna counties. And there are a lot of folks asking questions during those meetings and a lot of follow-up calls after where people are wanting to know, hey, I have a question. I set this up years ago. I'm not sure if I'm doing it correctly. If I'm running it correctly, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do year in and year out. Um, there's always changes to the laws. Do the, do, is what I have still what I should have? Things like that. So... Uh, I have asked you to join us because we had such great turnout. We're going to do more of those seminars, uh, one on May 24th in Wyalusing and then uh, June 14th up in Montrose. And so uh, you're going to be with us on that. That's going to be, we're going to be focusing on some of those topics in detail, right? But today I was hoping you kind of just give us an, an overview of, you know, why does somebody, why did some folks set these up or should they be consider setting them up? And then uh, some of the changes in the tax list, since people set those up maybe a decade ago, some things have changed that they might want to dust that off and either have a conversation with their attorney or certainly follow up with you and, and just see if they're still on the right path. Yeah. I mean, you know, Bob, we're seeing the same things. We're seeing a lot of folks. Uh, we helped them years ago. Some of them set up entities. Others waited. And they didn't set up entities, and it's really time for them to reconsider it. So uh, it's a confusing subject. There's yeah. a lot of different parts to it, a lot of moving parts. 
And it really does, you know, the more you can talk to somebody who's done it with a lot of folks, I think it can, uh, there's misconceptions. You can sort of help people get over some of the misconceptions. There's also options. It's really uh, the kind of thing that should be really well explained to somebody because one of the biggest problems you can do is set it up and then not know uh, really how it's supposed to operate. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you don't operate it correctly, it won't work correctly. Not unlike most machinery that I try to use in my backyard and everything (laughs) else, but we all have uh, our strengths. Exactly. And that is not mine. Uh, That is not mine, but that it's a similar type of thing. There's the, there's a correct way to set these up. There's a lot of customization that's permitted and, and is even a good idea to make sure it works for your needs. But it's also a thing that you don't put away, uh, throw it in your closet and never look at it again because it won't work the way it was supposed to work. Right. Yep. Okay. So nobody should be w- listening to this and going to try to do it on their own or to their attorney and say, this is how it must be, right? These are ideas that could pertain to them sorted out after this, right? Yeah. And it's if, if your attorney is doing the right job for you, and I know all of us attorneys try to do the right job, but it really needs to be explained really well to folks. And it really needs to be explained in a way where the different options are available so that it matches what their desires are. Right. And yep. at the end of the day, you want your client to really know this is exactly why I'm doing it and this is exactly what I need to do with it. So, right. you know, obviously we'll always answer the call and call them back. But if we do it right, they don't need to be calling us all the time. Right. It's really like it's set up in a way that really works well for them. So yeah. we love talking to a whole, a landowners about it. Uh, some of the nicest clients I've ever met, we've met up here through this process. Uh, and I, you know, I really enjoy doing it and love the talk today with, with some tips. I'm really looking Great. forward to going out and meeting some folks on the road with you. Before we talk shop, I forgot to mention, um, as, as an enticement for you to come here and do this sure, today, which sure. you really didn't need. And now I regret it, but. <laughs> sure, sure. I no. thought it was just your personality, but it's, it is more. It is more, <laughs> it is more. So we had a commitment to you, Paul. We said that we'd love to donate $1,000 toward whatever charity you'd like to just come out and, and sit down for an hour and share some thoughts on this. And so I'll ask you, do you have a charity in mind? I do. So, Bob, I know you're president of United Way of Wyoming. Wyoming, Wyoming County. Yep. Uh, I'm in the United Way of Wyoming Valley. I'm on the board of directors and on their executive committee. It's a really great cause, and I know you feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, the United Way of Susquehanna County, I know, is celebrating their 20th anniversary this year. And the Community Foundation, which was really instrumental in forming the United Way of Susquehanna County, has a program this year where they're going to match uh, up to $20,000 of increased gifts or new gifts to the United Way. That's fantastic. So in an effort to yeah. really leverage what you know you were willing to do for us, what I'd like to do is have you give that to the United Way of Wyoming Valley or United Way of Susquehanna County. Yep. And our firm will do will match your thousand dollar donation. So we'll each give to uh, United Way of Susquehanna County. Community Foundation will match that, assuming they haven't already done so, and we give four thousand to the good folks uh, at the United Way of Susquehanna. Wow! So that's how you pass the bar. That that intelligence. I love that. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah, I'm passionate about the United Way. Same I've here. talked about it on numerous uh, numerous occasions on this uh, show and. Uh, this radio show, as you sure, call it. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you call it a radio show instead of a podcast. You're killing me, though. Um, and dating yourself at the same time. Yeah, I felt good about it, though. It felt it, – this feels like a radio does, show right yeah, now. Yeah, I guess yeah. it does. It yeah. does. Um, yeah, that's great. I appreciate that, Paul. I mean, that's that's awesome to hear. Uh, you know your way does a lot of great things. It does. It's such an easy way to give to one, one location and have it reach so many different agencies yep. at the same time. And, and uh, the local counties know where that money is needed and they get it there. So thank you uh, to you and your firm for doing that yeah same to you yeah. i really appreciate cool. it yeah it's a great uh great cause and it helps me justify coming all the way up here to talk to you so <laughs> thank you very much thank you yeah all right that worked out well for everybody that's what we we're hoping yeah. for so so let's talk um let's just talk kind of big picture helicopter view of you know we've been saying at the seminars and i see a lot of people's heads shaking in the audience when i talk touch on this is back in 08 let's just say 08 ish sure when when gas was sort of signing leases and and getting the right protections for your property were, were sort of uh what everyone was focusing on uh there were some folks there were some i guess i would say legal firms and not just locally but there were a lot of out-of-town firms that were coming in saying hey you need to set this up into an flp or some sort of entity uh, and, and and I'd say that they were charging a flat fee for it. Everybody was different. But then I think a lot of people rushed into that. Some For some, it was a really good fit. Others, 
Maybe not so much. Maybe right. it was unnecessary. We also didn't know how things were going to play out. But maybe most importantly, I see a lot of folks that maybe have them in place and are not really sure, what should I be doing on this thing right. year in and year out? And is it is it still right for me? So, so just a real big picture. Let's just talk about the background of an entity and why you would set it up around your property. Sure. Yeah. Now, so um, number one is, as you know, these, these are landowners primarily who signed oil and gas leases with oil and gas companies for royalties. So we're really talking about those royalties that come from these oil and gas leases. Yep. It's where the money's generated. People have made some money on pipeline agreements and you know things like that, but that's principally what we're talking about. These. Right. And most of these leases, um, they have the possibility for production, you know, there's unitization, so not all of your... Um, Acreage is necessarily in production right away. It can come over time. And that's part of the planning technique, which we'll really get into. So there's really four main reasons that people do these. Uh, the first one is limited liability. Uh, a lot of folks don't, a lot of folks restricted access to the surface of their property when they entered into their oil and gas leases. But a lot of people didn't. So right. there's the, at least the prospect that the oil and gas company will be conducting some of, some of their operations in and around well sites and everything else on your property. That creates the prospect for liability mm -hmm. because we lawyers, and I don't want to talk badly about my brethren, but usually no, the way this would work. Else does, so yeah, yeah, well, there's, I've heard a few jokes over the yeah. years. Yeah. So, but in any event, um, <laughs> what happens typically is when there's an accident on a property, you know, uh, the person conducting the operations on there would get sued. They'd su sue the oil and gas company, but they also might sue the landowner. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, you know, you should have maintained this differently or should have had them on there or whatever else. So you could get pulled into that lawsuit as well as the oil and gas company. So right. by putting it into – and if you own it personally, and especially if you own it personally with your spouse, which is why most folks own it up here before we did, did a lot of these things, you're personally liable – if there's a, an uninsured liability. So in other words, uh, there's there ends up being an uninsured liability on your property, you're found to be liable. Not only are you liable personally, your personal assets, but if your spouse is a co-owner, all your marital assets are mm -hmm. also exposed to liability. So if you set up a limited liability entity, and we'll talk about what some of those different options are, something in Pennsylvania called like a full liability shield, the entities that have the full liability shield, what it basically means is absent your personal negligence, just you owning the property or being involved in the thing, you don't have any personal liability just by virtue of being the owner. Right. You okay. still, you know, you can't be out there doing negligent things in the name of the entity as if you'll be absolved from all sin that right. way. Right. But um, just by being the owner, you don't have liability unless you've done something. Mm -hmm. And that limited liability means, you know, whatever whatever's in the entity is subject to liability, right? Yep. But anything that you own outside of the entity, there's a shield, shield that prevents it become right. Okay. And so that if you have, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in a bank account that you and your wife own personally, and there's a problem with your property, they're not going to, they might be able to get the property that's in the entity, but they're not going to be able to get to your money in this account because that's yours and this liability shield stops it. Right. So that's, you know, a big reason why people do this. Right. Uh, you now, a lot of people say, hey, listen, I, I'll buy more insurance, right. which is fair. Sure. But if you've ever read insurance policies, there's exclusions and everything <laughs> right. else. So right. what we always say, it's not uh, in instead of, uh, insurance. It's in addition to, it's mm -hmm. sort of a safety net below the insurance for you to have this additional protection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. At a bare minimum, we've talked about at our seminars, you know, definitely be considering uh, an umbrella policy right. you know, for a husband and wife or an owner of the property, but that's just, you know, step one. Right. You know, this would be a much more formal step with much better protection, I guess, is what you would say. I think it's like, uh, it's a good way to have, we always like, I love the analogy of a safety net. Because you're going to have these different things that are going to try to protect you. You've you've had your contract with your oil and gas, and maybe you've restricted their access to to the surface, right? Yep. So that's one layer of protection. Then you have this insurance, which is a second layer of protection. Hopefully, everything's covered. Right. But if it somehow falls through, there's this net that catches it sort of at the end. Okay. And you know, good way to explain and it. And unlike insurance, where you're paying premiums annually, you know, this is a one. You know, you pay for it once. Mm -hmm. 
You know, there yep. might be some ongoing administrative costs, but you're really paying to set it up once. Okay. Uh, there are some entities that have annual fees, but a lot of them don't. There's an annual report requirement coming up, but it's all negligible. It's not a lot of money. And so, right. yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's number one. The second one is sort of uh, centralized management. What centralized management means is when you set up these entities, um, at f- the, you've got to, you set up rules about how they're going to be managed. At first, it doesn't really matter much. It's mom and dad are managing it, right? Yeah. But what this centralized management does is then at some point, these entities are set up to go to the next generation mm-hmm. and then the next generation after that. And assuming it's a family that's been fruitful, you know, um, could have three, four kids. Then there's three, four kids managing it. Right. Then at some point, maybe it's, you know, 12 grandkids. And then, you know, and it keeps going down. And what these rules do is really set forth, okay, here's how we're going to manage the entity. Here's how we're going to make decisions about the entity. And what we found is if you do it the right way and people are educated on it correctly, it actually avoids more family fights than it causes because when there's set rules and people are sort of ready for them, they tend to, you know, sort of fight less than when it's just sort of the wild, wild west. And they, you know, there's nothing in place to decide things and they're just all deciding things as they're on their own as tenants in common owning a property together. Yeah. So, you know, Paul, I got to say, as a financial planner working up in this area, we're seeing a lot more of that. And it just seems to be increasing as the years go through, right? right. The the generation that maybe signed the lease is, is... either has passed or is getting that's it's in their mind right? right and they're trying to pass it on and then you have the kids that have you know maybe none of the kids are even in the area anymore right or or some families are, are really tight and their open communication is great and they they get along really well and even even with that there's challenges right? right so having that structure in place is is key yeah and you know the other thing that goes with that is planning ahead for issues you and I were talking about it earlier there may be children who have different interests in into the property. There might be one that's involved with the farming for the property. Sometimes farming goes on on this as well, or quarrying, or some other activity, right. and they're involved in that business. And then you have kids who are, you know, maybe an accountant who who live in New Jersey, right? And so they don't have the same interest with respect to the property. But by planning correctly and and incorporating it into our overall plan for how the property is going to work and setting up a lease so they conform and everything else, it avoids a future problem, right. or at least it protects against it better. Right. Yep. So um, the other thing is uh, sort of goes to family and what we talked about earlier. You know, people are very attached to their property up here. I've noticed that in talking to people. They love their land. It's really like a part of them almost. And um, one big thing for them is, you know, you hear this a lot, keeping it in the family. Sure. And so part of what you do with that is once you've put the property into a limited liability entity, you want to set up what we call buy-sell restrictions, which try to keep it what we call closely held. Closely held is, you know, whatever circle you're talking about, usually for us, it's some some part of the family. Yep. Sometimes it's more circle restricted. Circle trust, man. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but in that family, people want to keep this property in the family as much as they can. One thing we hear a ton of people, you know, unfortunately, divorce, divorce has become yeah. such a big, big deal. And, you know, more than 50%. Now, luckily for you and I, we have very forgiving wives. It doesn't happen to us, but but you know, not everyone is as lucky as you and I. That was good. I told you to work that in. You <laughs> yes, did a great exactly. job. But um, that's one big thing we protect against with those buy-sell restrictions to make sure that if someone gets divorced, child gets divorced, you're not in business with a divorced spouse because right. that's not good. Yeah, it could be awkward. It, very. Sure. Yeah. And then the last thing and, and probably the biggest thing in a lot of respects is the tax benefits. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, federal estate tax is, you know, approximately 50%. That's a big, big tax. Right, right. And that's one you really want to make sure that you avoid. There's also possibilities we could talk a little bit about, like where you can save some on income taxes with some of these, you know, the, uh, some of these plans, some of these techniques. But the estate tax, making sure you don't get hit at a 50% clip is really, really important. And what this, mechanism allows you to do is if it's set up properly, um, you can gift interest in this entity that you set up to the next generation at a discount. 
Okay. The way the discount works is sort of like this. If you were to give me 50% of your of your property, mm-hmm. I would pay and I had no restrictions on me and there was, you know, I could do whatever I wanted, were tenants in common, I would pay you a certain amount of money. Let's call that its fair market value. Right. right. On the other hand, if you were to say, listen, Paul, I'm in this entity, I'll give you this interest in the entity, but I decide everything. You can't sell it to anyone. You have no say on this at all. All of a sudden, I'd say, well, I'm not going to pay the full 50% of that. I'll pay you, let's say, 30 40% less okay. because it's not worth the same thing to me because I, I don't have a say. I don't have any control and everything else. Right. That same mechanism is what you do to make sure you use less of what's called the unified tax credit. So unified tax credit, not to get too, you know. Yeah, we're going. Yeah, but. That's all right. You know, the unified tax credit. Unified tax credit is a big part of what this whole thing's about. Mm -hmm. Unified tax credit is, for lack of a better term, what you're able to give without incurring that that estate tax or any gift tax on the federal level. It's in excess of $10 million now. But the problem when you're planning for this thing is you don't know where it's going to go. And as we're going to talk about in a minute, Part of what's put it above $10 million is going to go away shortly unless Congress does something differently. And so using less of that unified tax credit, if we all knew it was going to be above $20 million, maybe you wouldn't be as worried about it. Not in the, that distant future, past rather, it was at 3 and a and $1 million during right. your lifetime. So, I actually remember those days. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that made it a much different thing, especially with some of the money that's coming in these royalties. Mm-hmm. Um, so using less of that unified tax credit through these discounts ends up making it more likely you're not going to have to pay that federal estate tax. Right. That's really what a lot of this is about. Yep. And yep. and it's 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 making sure that people understand that. And then planning for it is really, you know, those are the four reasons principally that you would do it. Yep. And And, and you had talked about income tax as well. Right. So you just talked about estate tax, but income tax could be a big saver as well. Yeah. And the way that works generally is, especially folks who are getting a lot of royalties in this thing, they may end up being in the highest tax bracket. Right, mm-hmm. so all the money that comes in, if it's these are all passed through tax entities, so they there's no entity level tax; they flow down to your individual returns. And if you're at the highest tax bracket, that money that comes in ends up being taxed at that highest tax bracket. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you have a child who's you know sort of maybe just recently graduated from college or is otherwise not making a ton of money on their own, you can when you gift interest in this entity, then they start receiving these royalties. So the royalties that are coming into them is taxed at that lower tax bracket. So from a family unit perspective, you're paying less overall taxes. Right. And simply by by doing it that way, it also helps with your estate plan because once you get less of the money in your own name, right, as yep. you're going along, especially when you don't need it anymore, Enough of these royalties come in. I don't yeah. care how, you know, and especially like most folks I know up here after they buy a Kubota and a couple other things, <laughs> they're not really that worried about, you know, they don't live extravagant lifestyle. Right. They have enough. They're modest people. I've always respected that. Um, they don't need the money and probably will never spend it. So mm-hmm. getting it into the next generation's hands is really important because then they can get it at the lower tax bracket. There's not as much in the parent's name that we have to get to the next generation because we've already done it. Mm-hmm. And so that combination of estate planning plus the income tax is really like a double way to really help yourself from right. a family unit perspective, pay less to Uncle Sam. Right, right. And, and I, I guess I would say there's a – everybody's got their own tipping point where you go like the very informal and far less efficient way of doing that is just have mom and dad get all the royalties, pay the tax on it. And then I give 5,000 to each of my kids. Right. That, that There's nothing wrong with that. But if your numbers start to get elevated, then you're talking about a pretty substantial tax savings potentially as, like you said, as a family unit. Right. right? And I think that's one of the things that we've been seeing a lot in our office. And we've been talking about at these meetings when you, as the, as mom and dad, whatever, whoever the patriarch matriarch is in that in, on that property, when you yourself start to feel saturated, like I'm full, like I literally, I mean, well, we've had folks say this in the office. I literally don't need right. any more money in my name. I'm good for the rest of my life. Right. It's really about my kids and my grandkids right now. 
And that's where structure like that could really be helpful, right? Because I think we're going to talk about control a little bit later too, but right. it's, it's, it's really nice. A lot of folks say that's, I love the idea of avoiding uh, excess taxation if I can and, and doing it all legitimately, but uh, it's the idea like, if I do that, I'll give up control and we'll, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it earlier. <laughs> right. We'll right. talk about that in a, in a brief time. Yeah, but, sure. But these are all real things. You want to talk about uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Transfer so, tax? So the one thing about the transfer tax, uh, Pennsylvania is realty transfer tax. Basically, any transfer of property with an exception of some exempt, exempt transactions will result in Pennsylvania transfer tax. Um, it's 1% to the state. And then your municipality either decides if it's if it's going to be another percent or like in Wilkesbury, I think it's two more percent. So it's three. I think Scranton's even more. But in uh, the northern tier, it's mostly two percent. It might be entirely two percent. And what you can do is um, currently, and especially if you transfer the entire property, and we'll talk about how much what what property rights to transfer in. The way that the realty transfer tax regs read now is as long as there is an assessed value for that, you can transfer it to this limited liability entity based on its assessed value. There's a there's a little change in the calculation depending on what county you're in. It's called the common level ratio, but right. it might be it might it might increase your assessed value. What that really relates to is how 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 recently the county assessed it. So how accurate is it? Um, but subject to that, you can pay it on that assessed value, which is actually doesn't take into account all the oil and gas rights. Right, right. And accordingly, you're able to transfer it without it being, you know, if you transfer the entire part without paying really transfer tax on all of that value. Mm -hmm. Who knows if they ever change that? Like yeah. if the state ever changed that, you know, which I haven't heard anything about, but it's certainly – you hear all the time that the Commonwealth needs money. That would be a very easy way to find some money. Right. You know, we we recommend to people, especially if they're thinking about doing it, do it while all these rules are like it's a great time to do this because we've got the really heightened unified tax credit over ten million dollars, over eleven. Right. You've got these good realty transfer tax rules. You've got for now. Yes. <laughs> you've got you've got portability. Right. So what portability means is. Uh, under some prior iterations of the U unified tax credit, you if your spouse died without using all of their unified tax credit and you didn't do the right estate planning things, you didn't get to use the rest. Right. And now what they've set up is what's called, you know, is, is basically allowing you with this portability, allowing you as the surviving spouse, whatever your spouse didn't use – even without some estate planning techniques, you're automatically allowed to use the rest. Okay. So, yeah. you know, what nice. that, that really helps because then, you know, what we used to do before this happened was you would segregate people's assets. Between mom and dad. Between mom and dad. Right. Which was, yep. you know, which was a pain, you know. Yep. And, and, and it also wasn't great from a liability perspective because um, whatever you own in your own name, if you have a liability – that's subject to that liability. But if you own assets jointly, there's something in Pennsylvania call, called the innocent spouse defense, which allows, you know, if it's jointly held property, one spouse screws up, they can't get that property, which probably lets your spouse sleep well at night knowing that, you know, <laughs> but no, but it's a right. really good technique, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, my only point is with all these things lined up this way, it's like the perfect time to do it. Mm -hmm. And here's the other part from a planning perspective why it's a really good time. Although a lot of people are getting a lot of oil and gas right now, some people are getting a lot of royalties, a lot of them don't have their entire property like we talked about earlier been unitized or is in production. They also, the price of natural gas is pretty darn low, mm -hmm. you know? And so when they value – when you're doing the valuation of your gift, and we talked about the discounts earlier, but when you're valuing what you're giving, which you know we have, we, you get an appraiser to do it. When they do that, as long as not all of yours is in, is in production yet, and as long as the natural gas price is still very low, what could in the future be worth way, way more when it gets into production and maybe right. the natural gas price goes over, you're able to gift at that lower value. Mm -hmm. And then discount it more based on these things. If you wait, theoretically, natural gas goes way up, right. the price of it. 
all of a sudden the gift you give the people is way more. Mm -hmm. So you're using more of your unified tax credit mm -hmm. and everything else, or way more, like if you're all of a sudden your entire property's in, and you know, some folks up here, you know, have three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred acres, mm -hmm. it could be an astronomical amount of money. But if you do it now, you're able to do it at a time where it's really a fraction of what its value is likely to be. Right. So all those factors can together just make it a really good time to do it. And you could do it at a little more measured pace. I mean, we talked about it. At the beginning, there was this like fever pitch for everyone to do it right away, do it right away. And I think some people rushed into it without knowing everything. Now, you know, you've got a little more time to have digested it and and now can make a really good educated decision with all these things, you know, in place. Yeah. And it's still a really good time to do it. Notwithstanding the fact that, you know, now it's 2023. Can't believe that's 15 years ago, <laughs> but you know it's still a very good time to be. I'm going to take about you that. off of what we specifically were talking. Sure, we kind of have an outline of stuff to go through, but on that topic you're just talking about, what do you say to somebody who has it set up and maybe it's wrong now, or they they need to they need to change some things? Like, is it too late? Like, oh, I did it and I'm, I got to sleep in this bed, or can they make adjustments? And how hard is that? Sure. To do? Well, it depends on the adjustment, but yeah, there's adjustments we make all the time with what folks have done. Okay. Um, I'll give you some examples. I love examples. Yeah. Make it a, make it a funny story. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Can attorneys do that? No, <laughs> nah, well, you yes. have me laughing at lunch. So yeah. Go ahead. I'll do my best sometimes. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, well, so here's an easy one. So sometimes. Um, one of the entity forms that a lot of people used, and we'll talk about it in a little while, while that might not be the right one anymore, was a family limited partnership. You'd right. hear people say FLP. Mm -hmm. The reason people used FLP so much, by the way, was because of this capital stock tax that existed in Pennsylvania. It was getting phased out forever right? and finally got phased out a few years ago. But because limited partnership interest in a limited partnership were not subject to the tax, but membership interests in a limited liability company were subject to the tax. Why? Go figure. Right. But because that was the case, these royalties, and it was a very complicated calculation for a capital stock tax, but these royalties everybody feared could result in Pennsylvania capital stock tax. So everybody used family limited partnerships because they wanted to make sure they didn't have that problem. Right. The problem with a family limited partnership or any limited partnership is it's sort of an antiquated form of entity. It, it, it's one of the older forms of entity. And what the rule is with a limited partnership, unlike all these other ones, is that the, the it has to have a general partner, at least one, mm -hmm. And, it ha and then it has to have at least one other partner than those are normally limited partners. Limited partners are basically passive owners in it. Right. And the general partner is involved with the management. But limited li the limited partnership rules say that general partner has to, has to have, unlike the limited partners who have limited liability, the general partner has to have liability for the debts and obligations of the partnership, which was, you know, I think it was the idea back in the law then was like, well, if you... If you had that, you know, stake, you know, in the game, you had, you know, sort of skin in the game, you would manage it more, you know, less recklessly, everything else. Well, okay. because of that, that that personal liability, what some people inadvertently did is they set up limited partnerships, but they had mom and dad as the general partners, mm -hmm. which makes sense conceptually because you say, well, they, they're going to manage it. But then they have personal liability. So it just deleted it all. It, it kind of nullified the whole purpose of setting up the LLP. In, in many respects. Right. I mean, let the kids have limited liability, but not the parents. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? So, no but that's, that. that's like the easiest fix going because all you do is set up a limited liability company or a, or a corporation that serves as a general partner. You have mom and dad own that. So indirectly, they're managing the entity. And they ha then have personal liability. So whenever we've seen that done, we just come in and we say, okay, let's fix it. You know, luckily nothing's happened. You haven't had that liability. We set up a limited liability company, or if the accountants prefer it, uh, an S corporation that owns that general partnership interest. You just transfer them that general partnership interest. And then mom and dad then own that entity. And it's no different in practice. Mom and dad are still deciding everything. It's mm -hmm. just they're deciding it, you know, legally under the umbrella of this entity. The protection. Right. And so that's like an easy fix that we see all the time. Right. But it's big. It's important, you yeah. know. And so that's one thing that, you know, that, we, that we've that we seen a lot of. The other one is, you know, some of them are harder, 
right? I don't know if you want to get into the property rights yet, but that's the, that's one that ends up sometimes being like you've transferred theoretically not the right property rights into it. Catch. Let's let because we have that kind of line item yeah, sure, a couple yeah. of details, but that's that's good. Can you tell well, I'm dying to talk about that part? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it under three hours, I promise. I promise. Before we get off the topic though, another sidebar uh, that came up. Uh we've been asked this question recently, which is clean and green. Sure. You know, um, you know, I have this farm, I have these acres in clean and green, and I'm doing something different. I'm transferring, uh, I'm, I'm doing something different on the surface of the property. There's a, there's a bunch of reasons that would sort of take them out of clean and green. But right. You guys are dealing with that in your office. Right? You do, yeah, right. It's part of it, but you normally you can navigate around it, and yeah. it normally is not a problem for clean yeah. and green. Yeah. I guess the only reason I want to t- talk about it real quick like that was just so you could weigh in because I know a lot of people are like, I can't do anything. I change anything. It's it's like the Ten yeah. Commandments gets written in stone. I can't change it. We're well, always yeah. worried about those rollback taxes, and that's whatever you know. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, this is you know this can be done without those problems. Great, yeah, great. Let's go to uh, the next t- topic we were talking about. Tax planning. Yeah. Well, so we got into we talked a little bit about the tax planning. There's also been some there's there's some other things that have come up recently. Some changes. Okay. And a lot of times, you know, uh, the law stays the same for a very long period of time. Over the 15 years since 2008, we've gotten a lot more gray hair, Bob, and a what? lot of things have changed. Uh, I'm just happy it's there. I don't care what color it is. <laughs> Same <man>. here. <laughs> the alternative's no good. Uh, but so there's been some changes. Some of them are not huge, but all of them are worth considering as you're deciding. Like you know, you had asked earlier if I've already done it. What you know, what might need to be changed, right? right? So. There's some tax changes on the horizon, theoretically, that unified tax credit, and unfortunately, I bored everyone with it earlier, but it's a big deal in this context right. because it's it, it's the size it is now. There's a sunset on the books. So when they did some of the changes several years ago, some of the changes to the tax code and everything else, including the increased unified tax credit, built into that legislation was that those laws would sunset. Mm-hmm. So unless there's a new law put in place, those these high limits are no longer going to be the the what's in place, mm-hmm. and they're going to go back to an earlier lower you know limit. Still, still a, you know still in the millions, but not not the you know eleven plus million that they are now. Right. So that you know, like we said, that's one reason to do it. The other big thing that's happened and and has changed the game a little bit about what entity you might want to have is uh, that Pennsylvania capital stock tax that we talked about earlier that mm-hmm. was. Everyone had concerns about it, and that's what led people to form the FLP. Uh, that's been completely eliminated. And so there's really no reason to have an FLP anymore. What most people are doing instead is just doing a limited liability company rather than a limited partnership. You can set it up the exact same way as your limited partnership functioned, but you just set it up as what's called a manager-managed limited liability company. So mom and dad are the managers. Right. And they could do it in their individual capacity, but they don't have to set up a separate entity. It's still taxed like a partnership, just like a limited partnership is. It has limited liability like a limited partnership. It just doesn't have that second entity, which, you know, to your point earlier, we talked about it earlier, a lot of this got very complex for people. Oh, yeah. It's too much, right? Well, it was actually, it was on top of, you know, trying to negotiate a lease right. and get the right price right. at the right time, keep control, and, you know, also worried about, you know, environment and what's going <laughs> and neighbors getting an argument. So was, there was so much happening right. in those several years. That was, uh, it was tough. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And what this does is it sort of allows it to be a little easier. So the more you can make it simpler, I think it, the it, the better. Yeah. And because, you know, as we talked about earlier, in order to get that limited liability, you've got to follow the rules that you set up. There's something called piercing the corporate veil, which is basically like if you're not following the rules of your entity, you might not get the limited liability protection. Right. So if you follow it, you can you can get that benefit. But if you completely disregard it, throw it, throw the book that your lawyer gave you in the closet, never pay it another mind, mix your money with the limited partnerships money, all that sort of stuff, that will lead you to not get the protections you you did the whole thing for. You went sure. through all this trouble and then you don't get the benefits for it. But if you could simplify your whole mechanism, it makes it easier to follow it. And right. so that's why a lot of people are doing limited liability companies rather than LPs if they're starting now. Yep. So in other words, rather than 2008, it's easier now. Yep. 
Yeah. And I could, I always make a joke about, I could, when I was in Montrose, no one ever talked about family limited liability company or, right. or family limited partnerships or anything like that. And we would literally have people during that one or two years of like frenzy walk in or call in and off the street and just say, talk to me about FLPs. Right. And I'm like, what world did I just move into here? Right. So right. That's how quickly it changed up here in, yeah. in Northeast PA. But um, you have some other things that you wanted to go through here. I, well, I don't want to jump ahead of you. Well, so, yeah, and there's there's just a couple little things that we won't spend much time on. But, you know, there used to be something called Tax Matter Partners. Everyone yeah. who has their agreement, they probably see it in there. There's a new regime that was set up with the IRS. It's just now it's a personal representative. It's a little different thing. The only reason for pointing it out is, in addition to everything else, most agreements need to be changed now. Most of your agreements have some outdated terms and things like that. And one of the reasons is, in addition to the tax changes, there's been some corporate law changes. Mm -hmm. um, most of the entities we're dealing with here have a brand new law as of 2016. The old laws have been replaced with a new one. Uh, there's some really nice features about these laws, but the bigger thing is it's a brand new law mm -hmm. and it has slightly different references. So, you know, a lot of the old agreements you'd have would have outdated references at this point. Is it the end of the world? You know, like the agreement might have, um, you know, might have had the right provisions in that say if there's a superseding law, it applies. But it makes it clear if you're able to sort of go through and do a new one. And some of the law, some of the ways the law changed sort of make it. Um, there's new options to consider how you do things. So that sort of thing. And uh, if anybody does want to get out of the family limited partnership regime, there's a really, e there's a much easier way to do it. You used to have to set up a new entity and merge that entity into your family limited partnership. Pennsylvania now has a really easy conversion um, statute that just allows you to do it in one step. So okay. if you were an FLP and you're like, I'd really like to be done with this, you can just do that with a conversion. So easy to go from an FLP to an FLLC. Is it, is it, or do you see anyone going out of the FLP just completely back to individual ownership? No. I was going to say probably not. No. Okay. I mean, once you've gone through that pain and you've paid your tax and everything yeah. else, um, and, you know, and you can convert into that limited liability company without having to have the, there's an exemption available so that you don't have the Pennsylvania realty transfer tax again. Right. So it's really seamless if right. you want to get there and okay. if you want to simplify things. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, you maybe speak to this. Oil and gas, I, you're up here probably more than me. Yeah. I see I see it picking up. Uh, I, I hear a lot of people talking about having, you know, a lot of their acreage, more and more of their acreage is getting unitized. Uh, it seems yeah. to be the, what, what I hear out on the street. Yeah, I was thinking back when you were talking about it's it could be the, a really good time on the, in the cyclical swing of right. where things are to maybe – either convert or if or move property into a, an entity like this one of the things that uh, you know a lot of folks are seeing is is the gas companies have gone become really proficient in their fracking right and they're doing i use the term super fracking i don't know if that's really the the terminology that you should be using but they're kind of going to existing units that maybe have been in production for a number of years have started high and now you know it, it is a decreasing right. uh, diminishing return or a uh, uh, resource. So when it gets, you know, to that stale part, they come in and they kind of regroup everything. They do some refracking and they put you in this, you know, larger unit and, and the royalties have gone through the roof. So if you're going, if you're in kind of that low time, it could be a perfect time on top of all the other reasons that you said. Yeah. Um, it's sort of counterintuitive, right? Like we're, where it's not as robust, that's the best time to do it, where you're not getting as much money. But it's, right. it's really true because, it's yeah, yeah, it's good timing. Yeah. We, we run into that with portfolios. You know, sometimes right. you, if you, you know, if you have a downtime, it could be time. Of, it's counterintuitive to put money into that thing right. you did poorly. Um, but, yeah, I, the other thing I would say is, uh, uh, and we, we see it right firsthand at these meetings where some people are seeing because net, net gas prices in the last couple of months have gone down substantially – they're seeing a slight tail off now, right? We, yet we're seeing other people who are shocked that their royalties are still staying at the levels or even gone up a little bit. Right. And a lot of that will have to do with the hedging that the individual <laughs> gas company has going inside of their their own internal controls on pricing, right. you know. But eventually, you can only hedge anything, for a, a trending commodity like that for so long before you have to see some adjustments. So, right, right. Uh, but that, that has been, you know, for 15 years, we've seen that. Way before it came in the Northeast PA, we saw commodities pricing of NAC gas and other things like that just they go up and down. Yeah. So 
Yeah. Take advantage of the trend. Yeah, absolutely. It's really a good time to do it. And so, you know, sort of the next thing we would normally talk to people about, you know, because we're meeting with a lot of folks now. They're like, well, you know, what what should I think about doing now? Like, you know, sometimes they have an entity and we look for things like I talked about earlier that are problems. And they say like, well, what else should I do? And so here's one thing we've seen a lot of people do. Um, number one, if they haven't transferred any property into it yet. If they haven't done this yet, they should do it, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked about the reasons why. Uh, and we'll talk about exactly how they do it momentarily. But the other one to really think about is if you've done it and done it correctly, um, what a lot of people did is at the beginning, like they just said, yeah, let me give each of my kids like 5%. Right. Right. And that's great. But if now, you know, they've gone to the point you said, the saturation point where they're like, geez, I, you know, this has been so much money and, you know, I live modestly. I, I'm, I'm never going to spend this. It's really time to consider whether you should do more, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Should, should we gift more? Um, but while you're gifting more, uh, you also want to make sure that, like, you do it carefully, um, not only to make sure you take advantage of the discounts by getting the right appraiser to do it and everything else, but also uh, mom and dad really don't want to lose control of these things. And they That's shouldn't. a big thing, yeah. Right. They really shouldn't. And so what you want to make sure that you do is you adjust everything, your rules, your management rules that you have in place um, to make sure you continue to have control over these things. And so, you know, there's percentages in there sometimes about how to uh, prove this, that, or the other thing. You want to make sure that mom and dad can still do it. Now, sometimes there's a reason you have at least one other child sort of sign on to it that, that it helps with the discounts and things. But there's, you know, some tricks like that aside from that. Uh, you just want to make sure they don't lose it. Now, what we've seen people start doing sometimes is we want to have the kids become, especially where there's a limited liability, uh, there's a general partner, limited liability ending ser serving as a general partner. They want the kids to start being involved in the management right. to learn the ropes, right. which is great. And we recommend it in a lot of respects as long as mom and dad keep control. Yeah. And so yeah. a lot of what we talk about is doing this in a way that makes sense from a tax perspective while not having mom and dad lose control. Mm -hmm. And so that's the conversation. Right. And uh, But because of all the reasons we talked about it being a good time to gift, it's a good time to do more gifting too, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you've already done it, you know, you might want to give more. And yeah. so that's what we're talking to a lot of folks about right and now. And there's, there's something to be said. I'm going a little off topic here for this conversation, but there's something to be said. We're, we're working more and more with families that – you know, a lot of situations we're dealing with, mom and dad weren't used to having this kind of money right? with these kind of responsibilities. You're talking about a lot of legal things uh, that you should be doing, accounting things you should be doing, financial planning things you should be doing. So it's kind of new to them. It's completely new right. to the kids. Right. Even though in, in a lot of cases, kids are between 30 and 50 years old, still never had those kind of dollars before. So the same reason that people were afraid to – uh, that cre they create trust, right? They don't want to leave. I don't leave my 18 year old a million dollars cash because the, it'll, they'll just blow through that. Right. Um, you know, setting up this entity, giving, getting them involved in the management, understand, Hey, look over my shoulder, watch what we do as your parents and manager managers of this company. Right. And then eventually I'm handing the torch to you. Nobody learns that overnight. And it's so much easier to make that transition. If you've worked with, your financial team, your, right. your legal team and stuff. And then you're used to, you know, I hate to set, make us sound subservient, but really the clients are always in charge right. and they hire us to support them. Right. Right. Well, that's right. And that's kind of weird for somebody to think I have this lawyer or this financial person like that's my guy or my girl, right. but we are. Right. right. And we're there to tell them this is your decision. This is what we believe is the best uh, way forward. And then they make that call. Right. And to just, have that sudden responsibility with having no experience, whatever, it's hard to do. So I think we're seeing more of a trend in our office that we're doing more of this family yeah. management, family meetings, you know, bringing the kids in for once a year, once every couple of years to have that conversation. It's fun. It's it's a good way to do it. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's once you get it, these, en these entities aren't that hard to administer. Right. But there's things, you, you know, when the money comes in, what do we do? Do we reserve any of that royalty money because we need it for X, Y, and Z or the things might come up? You know, um, do we 
when we distribute it, how do we distribute it? Do we distribute it, you know, according to ownership percentages, which is normally how you do it? Right. Or do you get into some fancy things like 704B of the partnership code where mom and dad, if they don't want the money anymore, but they want to keep the same ownership percentages, you can change the allocations of profit and loss to be not according to ownership. Mm. And so there's like there's little things like yeah. that. And, and sometimes people consider if they want to do those sort of things. <laughs> the other big family planning thing we do is exactly what you talked about earlier. You go, well, I'd like to give it to my kids, but they're, you know, 18, 19 year old. What if they what if they blow it? We right. all know how we were at 18, 19 years old. Uh, right. You know, you might buy a very fancy car that you probably couldn't f- afford or didn't need and everything yeah. else. I don't right? know what I would do. I didn't have any. <laughs> well, <laughs> no it wasn't an issue that. for me right, either. Right. But yeah, but but theoretically, you know, too much money when you're too young may not be the best right. uh, setup. So one thing that we do sometimes is um, when we do the buy-sell restrictions that we set up, sometimes you say, you know, there's usually a list of permitted transfers. We talked about it staying closely held in the family. You set up rules that say, okay, here's the transfers that work with, you know, that are allowed in our entity. Mm-hmm. And one of them is normally, well, you can give it to your kids or trust set up for the benefit of your kids. But a lot of families decide they want to set a limit on when the kids can own it outright. Mm-hmm. So rather right. than saying like, you know, you have to be 18 at least to own things in your own name. But if you want to set it up so that, you know, you don't think it's good for someone to own it in their own name until they're 30 and that it could be in a trust for their benefit and be used for things like schooling and things like that, but not for Corvettes, right. you can do it. And so that's, you know, when I talked earlier about really understanding people's desires, understanding really what they want to do with their family unit to make sure it sort of functions the way they think is the right way, mom and dad. That's part of it. That's part of what we talk to them about. It's like, well, when do you think it's a good idea for kids to have that much money? Mm -hmm. But the benefit of doing it that way then is you allow for it to go into these trusts for the benefit of these kids at an earlier age. You take advantage of all the stuff we said but you're not worried about them blowing the money because you have it with trustees that they trust that aren't going to go let them go blow the money. Right. It's just another way sort of as you're going through this thing to make it fit what what the folks want to do with it. Yeah. You know? And the thing I've always noticed about, you know, a lot of people up here really have a really good idea of what they what they think is the right way to do it. You know, they've lived and they've, you know, they've they've worked hard and everything else and they have an idea like here's the correct way of doing things. And when I talk to them about like, well, here's the options and everything else, most people are pretty clear on what they want to do. Yeah. And so I just think it's really lining up the things for them to do and then they're like, I, you know, and we've seen it so much, our documents are sort of based on what most people want. And it's really kind of consistent. You yeah, know, it's amazing right, right. like as you're going through, like it's not like one size fits all, but it's one size fits a lot of it because yeah. they really do, you know, a lot of people have similar values and similar ideas on what makes sense. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know. So are you guys, good. are you guys, Paul, um, it, from what you're saying, and, and I know, I kind of know the answer here, but I'm kind of letting you, letting you answer. Sure, you're T-ball. Or uh, uh, what, yeah, I'm tossing you a softball here. Um one and done. Like I've seen people set something up with a legal firm and that's the last they've heard sure. in this last involvement. But we just already have talked about a lot of, you know, state law changes, federal changes and things that just changes in their life that may have changed what they did five years ago. So are you proactive about that or do you reach out to them when there are law changes or do they sh- – what I want to try to do is make it easier for these – for landowners in this situation to understand like what's on my – back or my table or my lap for responsibilities and what's on yours yeah no i mean exactly like we usually reach it we like to tell people all the time when we finish like whether it's our state plan or this or anything else like don't be a stranger for too long right Mm -hmm. so you know we try to reach out to clients every once in a while and say you know how's things going everything else we usually say at least within five years you should almost always revisit your state plan and and you're your situation with your entity, right? Mm-hmm. Where the where the gifting percentage is, everything else, because things change, right? Um, sometimes it's like you know, there's been new additions to the family. Sometimes it's uh, you know, we we have someone we have to do things a little bit different with because you know they've got special needs. I mean, there's yep. there's a lot of different things. Or mom and dad, God forbid, passed. Or you know, there's a lot of different things that could happen. Um, but if you're not talking to people and you're not, you know, you, you don't know. Right. Uh, the other thing we reach out to a lot is people like in your shoes. You know, I, I find that folks talk to uh, their accountants, their investment advisors 
way more than they do lawyers. It may have something to do with the fact that we bill hourly. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but but either way, we try to let you guys know as yeah. soon as possible. Like I sent you that thing recently. Uh, where we learned that the Department of State had inadvertently sent out oh, yeah. notices to all the limited partnerships right. that they needed to file a certain thing that they didn't. Well, I mean, we, we sent it out to a lot of people, but getting it to influences, you know, people who speak to a lot of people is another great way to get the word out yeah. there. Because I'm sure as you were you know running into people, they were asking you that question, you could tell them right away. Right. That's the same thing we try to do. We do a lot education-wise. We do a lot with our, uh, put a lot on our website, put a lot in, you know, we write articles every everything else. Anything we can get out there, we do email blasts. It's just keep people up to speed on what they need to do, right? you know, right. as much as possible. Because I agree with you the way you said it. It's like, you know, it's a service industry and sometimes people lose track of it, but that's really what it ends up being. You're trying right. to serve people, serve their needs, everything else. And if you can do that well, that's when you've done your job well, right? you know? Yeah. And, and if you, you know, too many people, I think were sort of trying to put out like, Here's the product I'm selling up here. And it's a one size fit all yep. and everybody should do it. I really don't believe in it that no, way. Neither do I. Yeah. yeah. And I and this is a it's gonna sound braggadocious, but the from what we've seen, it, like, you know, now we have we we're just talking about it. we have an extension at Stonehouse also we own a, a tax business, right? And we did that because most people always have like, oh, do you all, can you do our taxes as well? So we have a lot of clients now that use our tax service as well. But we still have a lot of clients that have been with their accountants for years and right. they've been great. Some of them are great accountants. All we care about is that the communication lines are open. Right. So if we have something going, for some reason, and I think it's because of, of the questions and the concepts that we go through with them at our meetings, we seem to be the first stop for right. the question. The accountants are usually there. I'm not saying the accountants wouldn't return the phone call in a heartbeat, but they're more like the once a year visit. Right? Sure. Um, and I think also... Uh, when needed, I need to get my legal, my attorney in here to give me some legal opinion or advice on this. But for if it's like I'm kicking around an idea or I've had some change in my life, I think it starts with us a lot of sure. times. What makes it great, and this is one of the reasons I've enjoyed working with you through the years, is is hey, we need to get Paul in here. You need some advice. You know, here's a couple of attorneys that you know we feel good about, and then you know they can vet them themselves. But sometimes people have already have that relationship, right? right? But that's great. I really don't care who you use as long as you feel confident, and then they can communicate with us. Because what I hate is I hate to see is is the clients. There's a lot going on here, especially right. with the folks that we're talking about in, in today's conversation. So many moving parts for them to feel like it's all on them is really tough. It's overwhelming, and, it and, and that yeah. usually causes like no action. Uh, yes, right, one hundred percent. Like so, if you're in doubt, you do nothing. Right, and unfortunately, it's probably not the right thing to do right now. And like you and I talk yeah. about it, like you know, thankfully we were both really busy, so we're never pushing these things because we're trying to fill a quota or anything like that. Because right. it's not the right. way we work and it's not the way we advise people. Uh, so when I tell them, it's like, I'm just telling you, like, if I were sitting in your chair, here's what I would be thinking about. Here would be my decisions that I would be making on it. And if people ask me, like, would you do it? I would absolutely do it almost in almost every situation because there's so many different levels of benefits. Right. And it's not that expensive. And I think it really helps. But they've got to get comfortable with it. You know, and there's things about it that they have to get comfortable with it and they have to make decisions. And we, you know, we talked about some of the decisions you make along the way, right. how, what property rights you transfer in, what entity you choose, all that sort of stuff. The only way you can make that is if you're open to a good conversation about it, you have good advisors. You know, we always think about, you know, someone's investment folks, someone's, you know, uh, accountant and then their lawyer all being on the same page is a really big deal. Yeah. Really, Th those really three are the deal. big yeah. triumvirate, yeah. whatever you want to say. Yeah. Yep. And I if would, I would say, think of uh, our clients should think of folks in our position as sort of a, an extension of a parent. And I say that because if my mom were looking at this video right now, she'd say, Bobby, you need to wear brighter colors. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> she, right. she literally will say that right. to me. Like, why are all your videos with like gray and black and, right. and dark green shirts? I think you look good, though. Thanks, I do. I yeah, it. I do. <laughs> but I mean, but, and joking aside, we're advisors. We're not dictators, right? So, so we have. I think we give a lot of great advice. It may not always be the ultimate best advice. Right. We're going to give you the best advice at that time, right? And we'll adjust. And I think people miss that adjust part, right? And they also 
I, I think it's important for them to know that they're always 100% in control. Right? Well, that's the thing. I mean, too many times I think people just said, I'll just do whatever you say. Right. And, and I don't really like anybody to do it like just without, you know, I I don't even need to hear the whole thing. I'm like, I insist on it because I don't want <laughs> yeah, you've them. you've done that to me. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I really want them to hear the whole thing and make sure they make an informed decision yeah. because then you feel better about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, to what we were talking about earlier, if you understand it better, you'll a lot of it is you doing it yourself too. And it's not that hard, but you got to understand the mechanism you're setting up. You got to understand the car you're driving then, right? right? We line you up with the right car and give you some instructions on what to do with it. And we'll be there to any questions you have, but you kind of got to do it month to month. You're not going to want to bother with us every month while you're making your distributions, right? right? You right. can, but you don't you don't want to be and we don't want you to be. So I may have uh we may have gone off uh, ahead of ourselves here. So what I have two quick questions for you. Number one, if I'm uh I want to gift some I've had this entity in place. I want to gift some ownership to my two children this year. Sure. What's the process? Well, so it's pretty simple, right? I mean, we would go through those issues we talked about. Here's some changes to the agreement we might want to make. They should talk to you candidly and maybe their accountant and say like, okay. The one thing we always tell people is some people say, I'll gift everything. My kids will take care of me. No, yeah, don't bad do idea. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. If you know what's an interesting phenomenon is a lot of times when people retire, they've had a million dollars in their retirement or collectively or whatever. But now because it's it's rolled out of the company plan and now it's kind of theirs, right. they feel like they're really richer. Right. And then they want to give money to the kids. And I'm like, wait a minute, you're 60 years old. You know, it's, People live you know, a long time now. We're hoping God to live. Yeah, yeah right. right. So it's, it's so hard. It's great to give money to your kids. It's really, really hard to ask your kids for the money back. Right. Right. So trying to time that well. Well, and, and it, you know, there's also some things like if you gave it all away. And I mean, it might not, not even, some of this gifting might not work as well. I mean, there's a bunch of different things where it doesn't look real, you know, like, right, right. like nobody transfers, gives away all their money typically while they're still alive. So it looks like it's not a, not a real transaction, but it's also no good, right? It's not the way you want to do it because you don't want the kids having to give money back up. And, and it's yeah, just, because then, you know, then you're using part of your unified tax credit down, then they're using it back up. I mean, it's yes. just not a good way yeah, to do exactly, it at all. Yeah. Um, but after they find out sort of like, okay, where do I stand financially? And, you know, sort of, what makes sense here, usually plan it up. You know, sometimes um, people will want to do it and and they'll want to use, you know, um, they might want to have it be in a certain year so they can, you know, they can do the gift tax return later. So, you know, whether we do it in this year or the other year, you know, whether they take advantage of any of the annual gift tax exclusions too. I mean, there's different things like that, but it's a pretty simple process. I mean, it's really just one page document that's like an assignment of limited partnership interest mm -hmm. the way we set up our or a membership interest in this entity it's um usually we set it up these agreements with an exhibit that can be changed pretty easily you amend the exhibit to change the ownership percentages and then you need to get it depending on when you last gifted you probably need to get an updated appraisal because you're going to have to file a gift tax return and that appraisal is going to have to be attached to it uh -huh. Appraisal is good for just that year? Some pe I think some people are comfortable. You know, it's really tax advisor call. I've seen some people say if the circumstances haven't changed that much, like maybe two years or something. But, okay. um, but you know, it can't be from 2008, right? right and so, right. <laughs> you know, and so, but but doing that, you know, and, and taking advantage of it and all the things we talked about, it's a pretty simple process. And we set up the agreements originally so that, we can change them without too many bells and whistles. And because we do it a lot, there's a form we have that usually is like, okay, this is the same thing we did with this family. It's yep. going to be almost the same thing. Right. So it's we're not reinventing the wheel every time. Gotcha. Yeah. What about um, when it comes to uh, sort of – if I haven't set an entity up, right, right, and and you're thinking this might maybe this is a good time for me to finally put this into a family limited liability company or something, somewhere. right? So, what's that process look like? Well, so number one, we're going to talk to your tax advisor and and you about what form of entity makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. uh, in this context, it's probably going to end up being the family limited liability company, right? Yep. And when we call it a family limited liability company, it's just a limited liability company, but you're setting it up for your family. It's not a different type of entity. That's just sort of what people call it. Um, 
And normally, you know, in, in this context, partnership tax principles are helpful when, with real estate ownership and things like that. And partnership tax principles, unlike like an S-corp, allow you to vary allocations of profit and loss, which sometimes could be an estate planning technique. So for all those reasons, normally you want partnership tax. And because you can avoid having that second entity as the general partner, normally you'd want a limited liability company rather than a limited partnership. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And so you're probably going to end up there. When we do this, right. I mean, you could talk about it, and you know, some people might have slightly different ideas on things, but that's probably where you're going to. We end just up. I actually had Ben Denault, our CPA, in here just uh, two days ago. We talked about it'll probably be on our website after this video, sure. But talking about the benefits of making sure you take care, of, you know, the S corp, the partnership taxed that way, taxes yeah. an S corp, I should say. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different options, but normally, you know. Um, Having it be a partnership and having it be partnership tax, limited liability company is the one we see most frequently. Our next question is, okay, I've got my entity. What am I going to transfer into this thing? Right. Right. Yep. And that's a big question for folks. Right. Um, and so we're talking about the property, right? And when you talk about real property, there's a couple different things um, to it. It's usually good because these are the different rights you might transfer in. So there's the surface, you know, with your home on it and everything else, right. you know, Um then you have what's called the subsurface. Subsurface is really all this oil and gas rights and everything we're talking about. Um, all the things that are sort of the basis for what you're leasing, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the air above it, which isn't really all that relevant. The other part of it is in Pennsylvania, there's not a separate property right for what's called a, ro a royalty deed. There's not a there's not a royalty right that's a separate property right. In Texas, there is. Right. In Pennsylvania, there isn't. And so what ends up happening is you got to decide what you're going to put in. And what a lot of people want to put in is really just those royalty rights. Like that would be the preference because yep. it's the least disruption to their life and they still own their home. They still own their land and everything else. There's a couple reasons, though, that that may not be the right choice. Number one is, you know, if you don't have the entire property in um, from a – from a liability perspective, if something goes wrong on your property, you still got that limited liability. And some people say, well, yeah, but I have enough insurance. So, you know, that one some people could overlook. The biggest problem is if you only put those royalty rights in, the tax advisors we've worked with have talked to us about what's called an assignment of income doctrine. Okay. The simplest way to look at assignment of income doctrine is to think of like an analogy of the tree and the fruit. Okay. So, it says if you haven't given away the tree, but you've only given away the right to the fruit, mm -hmm. you haven't actually given it away. So what should happen is every time you tr should be treated as having received it and then gifted and they the, gift it. Yeah. And that defeats a lot of the purposes we did here. Uh, it's the same thing with this royalty, right? The royalty is sort of the, the fruit. Right. And the, the tree would be the subsurface or the entire property. Okay. Right. I feel like my, you're reminding me of my kindergarten teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I painted a pretty picture there. But I mean, that to me, I always think about like when I'm explaining it to clients, I always think about like, like what makes sense to me when I sort of, and I'm a, the tree with the fruit always just made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And, you know, so like, I think that some of the cases under law would be like somebody had a lottery <laughs> ticket that was a winning lottery ticket and like they gifted it, you know, you know what I mean? And yeah, so, yeah. Right, right. And then they Makes really should have gifted the proceeds, things like that. Um, so that's the worry if you only do the royalty. Now, have I heard about it being like enforced all the time? Not really, but it's there and it's a bit of an issue. And then you also have this issue where you don't have, you know, the liability protection. The other thing people could do is just give away the sub transfer the subsurface and keep the surface. The problem with doing that is technically, if you read the realty transfer tax rules, if there's not an assessed value, you're supposed to get it valued. Appraised. Right? Appraised. And the subsurface doesn't have its own assessed value. And so if you only transfer that, the argument is you should get it valued like you would get it if you're gifting and mm -hmm. you got to pay a much higher transfer yeah, it'll tax. Yeah, a much higher value. Yeah. So if you transfer the entire property in, there's really a really a benefit That's to it. it. Yeah. The downside is now technically your home is now in this entity. Now there's things you can do to avoid that, like you could uh, subdivide it before you do it and just you know subdivide a portion of the surface where, where you live and everything else and do that. It's, but it's a hassle. So people a lot of times don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. 
And if you do, you know, put your property in, your home in and everything else, then you technically have to lease it back from yourself if you're doing it appropriately because, you know, we want to follow corporate formalities. We want to follow the reality of the situation. If I transfer my property in and a limited partnership owns it now or a limited liability company, you know, they wouldn't just let me use it for free because it's not, you know, so you got to act like it's it's real. And that's the part people don't yeah. love. But so- Cumbersome. But all of that I just talked about, that's what you talk to new landowners when they come in and you say, okay, here's the options and here's the, you know, I've seen people do it different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen, you know, and, and it's just a matter of deciding what you what you think is the best approach. So once you know that's what you want to do, then we transfer it in. Um, you know, there's a uh, there's a transfer tax due on it. You pay the transfer tax; it's two percent. You know, assume you put the whole thing in of your assessed value. Now the entity owns it. Um, to avoid it being what's called a step transaction, you know, after you put it in, you normally wait a period of time, at least thirty days, before you do gifting. Mm-hmm. So you transfer the property in. It's initially owned by this entity, owned by just mom and dad. Then. Th- at you know at least 30 days later that's when you consider start doing your gifting okay and then with the gifting you have to get the appraisal like we had talked about and then the kids sign on to this agreement we put in place for the entity that has all the buy sell restrictions the management rules all that stuff we talked about earlier and then it's set up for everybody and if you do it right you really explain very well to the kids what we're doing it for the reasons we're doing it both tax and all the things we talked about and what the plan is on go, kind of going forward, right? Mm-hmm. Like at some point, maybe we'll bring you in for this. And when you're, when we're gone, you'll, you know, you kids will then manage it through this. And, you know, the yep. more, the more I've seen people explain it to their kids, the better it is. Absolutely. The better it is. Cause they're all of a sudden they're not as worried about it. Yeah. Yeah. And although a lot of those conversations there, we've been asked to be a part of. Same because, here. Because the, the technicalities, you know, right. like. What, wait, mom, dad, why, why did you do this one thing over here? Like, uh, you know, I remember there was a really good reason. Right. I can't remember what it is. Right? right. So if you're there to say, oh, yeah, that's for this and this, you kind of co-present it to the kids and and just be a sounding board. And, and it's really, they're really fun meetings. And the, most of the families get along really well. Or if they have been sort of off in their own directions, it gives them a reason to come back in and talk about it. There's a lot, lot of opportunity there. What I what I like is that moment where like, like there's sort of a consensus and the whole family unit sort of gets it and it's like, yeah, we're in. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's the, when it does that, and it doesn't always happen, but a lot of times it does. It's like everybody's in on it mm-hmm. and they feel like it's a family decision. I think, yeah. you know, it really is mom and dad's decision, but a lot of parents really want to treat it more like a family decision. And yeah. And, and I'll say, I'll say this, I'll get off this topic, but when, when mom and dad pass away, having a structure like this in place, and especially if you have that that educational part up, up front. So like everyone knows kind of what to expect. We right. just don't know when it's going to happen, but eventually this is going to be ours to be in charge of. Right. They know what their role is. They know what percentage they own, what they will own. It's just, there's not a lot of surprises there. And there's already this, this uh, tendency to like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to get along or we're, or we're not going right. to, we're going to fall apart. Right. Right. And I, that's a big plus for mom and dad. But it's not. It's a lot different than if if mom and dad died and and we have to go through mom and dad's clothes and their and their you know couple of things that they have collectibles. You know, there might be a little fighting over that. When you start to throw large amounts of money right. in, it can also it, as nice as that is what I just described. I've seen it rip families apart no because doubt. they have no structure, and then it, everybody comes in with their own attorney. And it's just all this. Too many attorneys silo. is never a good thing, no. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never, never, never the good thing. But yeah. I mean, these are real things that people, you know, I we see it all the time. I have two kids that don't live here. I have one that does. I have I have one that wants to work on the farm. The other right. two are local, but they have not, they really don't care about the property itself. They'll, they'll never step foot on it. That's right. okay if we're not there. So like, everybody's different. Yeah, yeah you know, it's uh, and there's always side issues, right? So. You know, sometimes people think this agreement is going to dictate like where things go when you die. Well, it allows for transfers. Well, what effectuates those transfers is either gifts or your will. Yeah. So your will has to be sort of brought in into compliance with this thing too. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so let's say you your your agreement says you know kids can't receive it outright until they're thirty. Until then, it needs to be in a trust. Well, your will better say that. 
mm-hmm. because otherwise it won't be a permitted transfer and then it might lead to a yeah. buyout right. Yep. So it's it's just making sure that it all works together. And then, you know, you brought up a great example with farming. We, you know, you and I were talking about it earlier. A ton of, a lot of the folks that we deal with also operate a farm. You know what a big part of that their life that is yep. and, and, and in their family life and everything else. So a lot of what we've worked with them on is also – you know, making sure they can keep doing the farming they want to do, long-term leases, things like that, um, but also sort of putting it into a limited liability entity so that any liabilities that might arise from those farming operations doesn't affect this wealth that they've been able to accumulate through the royalties. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's when we talked earlier about making sure you, you sort of know exactly what they're trying to accomplish, sometimes that's a big goal. You know, yeah. let's 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 make sure we can keep farming this land the way we wanted to. Yep. And so there's ways to do that too. Um, we're probably going long. Was, who, who, you invite <laughs> a lawyer to this? Who, who would have thought that would go long? No, I'd say, but I, people could have tuned off if they wanted to. But if, for folks that are still listening, I'm sure that like this is really important to them, and they're they're invested. So I want to talk real quick before we wrap up. Uh, you obviously are a big fan. FLPs were popular for a good reason. You talk about that. Uh, family limited, but basically an LLC that's for the family. Right, right? right. FLLCs are becoming kind of the go-to vehicle today. What about trust? Because we still have people that call up and say, should I, should I put my acreage into trust? Yeah. And so, you know, there's good reasons for trust. We bring them up as part of the options. The problem with trust is they can be super inflexible, right? And so- you know, you make decisions with limited partnerships, some of these other things. They're they're more capable of being adapted over time. Right. Trust, especially if they're irrevocable. I mean, they're, you know, if they're revocable, they can be changed, uh, but they don't accomplish a lot of the purposes you're going to do. Right. If they're irre- irrevocable and everyone's still alive and things like that, sometimes you can revisit them. But sometimes you're stuck with them. Right. And that's really not what people want. And then one of the big problems with them is – Trusts are taxed at the highest tax bracket. Yeah. So if anything gets stuck in there because it, the, tr- the terms of the trust don't allow for it to be distributed or it's not distributed, you're ended up paying the highest tax bracket, which is oftentimes, you know, you talk about for your family unit, as much as you want. I mean, you want to really be in a position where as much money basically gets down to the family unit that they can keep, whether it's mom and dad or the kids or whatever else. You don't want it to get taxed right. as much as you can, right? You know you're going to pay your fair share. Everybody's going to pay their fair share, but you don't want to pay more than you would need to. And that's part of the problem with trust. If you talk to a lot of tax advisors about trust, that's the biggest gripe. Yep. If you talk to lawyers about trust, a lot of the biggest gripe is that it's very inflexible. So, you know, people make a decision about it and they want to revisit it depending on where they st- where it stands, they, they can't. Yeah. And a lot of these other yeah. entities, you can just, you know, you could just modify them, you know, amend the agreement. So it's not that trusts never have a place. It's just sometimes, um, sometimes they're overused. Now, they're great for some things. Like if, you know, when you're trying to uh, keep assets away from like a divorce or, you know, right. sometimes that's that. a really good way to do it. Right. Um, but the cost, you know, everything's cost benefit analysis. Yep. And so that's, you know, that's what I usually hear people say why they don't want to do a trust. We talked about a lot. Yes. What did we miss? Anything? You know, I got to tell you, I think, you know, I could talk about this forever. You're Anybody listening is going to be sleeping. Yeah. It's going to be too much. <laughs> I think we hit the big stuff, to yeah. be honest with you. And um, I hope it came across that I think you and I both feel pretty passionately about helping people who are in the spot and making sure we do so in a way that – they understand it and that they are happy with the decision they made. And, you know, you talked about like 2008. I never want people to regret it after the fact, right. you know, and then maybe yeah. if they regret it, at least say that, you know, well, I, at least I did it with my eyes wide open, you know, because. Right, right. And it, I, I find when people come to us a lot of times with their investments, they, they're like sheepish about one or two things that were real dogs in their right. overall investment choices. But, you know, never regret that. We're not going to be managing your money for yesterday. Right. We're managing it for tomorrow. And, uh, you know, nobody's perfect, right? That's why we're just talking about diversifying the risk and all that stuff. That's a whole other boring conversation. Right. We keep saying we're knocking <laughs> ourselves. I'm super ja- – like, I love my job, and I know you do I too. I do. I and, do. And I'll just – I'll put a plug in for you, Paul. Just as an individual, I think you're a great guy. I've, I always enjoy talking with you. And I also know 
when I'm talking to you about our stuff, I know that you have our interest in mind. And and I think whenever you're talking to any of your clients, they get that vibe as well. And that's super important. Like that, that to me, that's like the first step in doing right. anything for anybody in our kind of industry. Um, and the second part of it is that people should understand, um, you know, your firm, Rosen Jenkins Greenwald uh, out of Scranton or Wilkesbury. Wilkesbury, yeah, sorry, Wilkesbury, out, yeah. out of Wilkesbury. Um, I'm always used to dealing with you on the phone or in person. So sure. I keep forgetting about that. Um, and you have new offices. Where's your new office? So we're right across from Motor World on 315. Yep. It's much more easy on off. And Perfect. so, uh, you know, it's not as easy to walk to circles and things like that. That's how it works, but we're living with it. Yeah, you know? But everybody but, knows where that yeah. is, and that's great. It's yeah. a beautiful office. Um, what I what I really like about your situation, the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is, is when people are talking about entities, that's really an area where you – live in all the time, right? right? And, and you're doing these in and out and they have so many nuances, intricacies that could trip you up if you don't know what you're doing. No right? doubt. And yep. I know you've helped us at times when, you know, I think I helped to manage, I think four different LLCs right now. Right, right. <laughs> and you've been a great resource for me. So I appreciate that. So um, whether they're dealing with uh, with you or another attorney, it'd be nice to make sure that that attorney has some, some sort of uh, specialty in that area i think for, for this type of a deal listen that's our whole firm is specialized like that i've yeah. literally one time i was in a courtroom my entire career <laughs> to which my grandmother said what she found out was so you're not a real lawyer you know which was <laughs> which was really nice but, grandmothers are brutal yeah yeah, yeah yeah well i said not really but uh that's you know great. doing all right but um but yeah, and uh, you know, listen, I really appreciate it. I feel like the thing I like working with you, Bob, is I feel like you advise and care about clients the same way we do. Right. And it's really nice when you work with a professional that's sort of, I think people who get used to you could, would feel more comfortable with me and vice versa. Right. I mean, you're right. probably funnier, maybe a little more generous, <laughs> but you know, but overall, I think it's a similar situation. You're welcome here so, anytime, yeah. man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But no, but, I appreciate you inviting me, though. I really yeah. enjoyed it. It was fun. Thank you. And, yeah. and, and once again, um, so Stonehouse is donating a thousand dollars, and you designated that. Rosen, to, Jen, yeah, yep, United so, Way of uh, Susquehanna County. Yep, and now Rosen and Jenkins and Greenwald is donating, uh, matching that. Yep, and now with that uh, recommendation, it looks like potentially the Community Foundation may match that as well if they haven't maxed that out, uh, that agreement out already. So. It's great bang for our buck. So everybody wins, and hopefully the the folks that watch this, if they're still hanging in there, right? <laughs> right. Uh, True. They know that, that we, it's a we do a lot for our community. We spend yeah. a lot of time in and around all these folks, and and grew up here. So thank you very much, Paul. Yep. Thank uh, I, you. I might ask you to do it again. I listen. I would love to. It was fun. It all was right. fun. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.